sip. Okay, caveat. This is great. So caveat, this is so amazing that I feel like you should have talked, been talking to Jose because while we were sitting there, like you were like nodding yeah. your head. What were yeah. you nodding your head about? Um, a lot of keywords, democratization of healthcare, um, everything about a black box. I feel like that's very applicable, either creating a black box in terms of um, abstracting very complex ideas and also in terms of breaking the black box in terms of um, helping people understand how technology works and what's really going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Yeah. So, Kavio, when we were backstage or in another part of this magnificent building, you introduced me to your physics teacher. Yes. Mark, right? Mr. Hannum, yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Mr. Hannum, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hannum, okay. And so, that's very special. You come here to give a talk, your physics teacher comes in, and you are uh, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. You're 17, the youngest member uh, of the long, um, long Conversation series here. Have a hand for Kavya. This is... So what makes that relationship so special? The relationship um, between me and my teacher? Yeah. Um, I think that um, in many ways that we have obviously so many great mentors and so many things that we can learn from all the different people in our life, but there's also, I guess, between the mentorship, a way to teach people as well. Um, I think that, um, I think it's great, especially because I go to a science and technology magnet school, that we have um, such supportive teachers and supportive students. And I, I think if I went to a regular school, my teacher would be like, on a Friday night, coming to your thing, what? Um, but Mr. Hannum's always been really supportive of me. And I think that speaks to the community that um, that has been built in my school. Um, and that's what makes me optimistic about the future, um, that we have um, mentorship for younger students like myself and an opportunity to become a part of this community that's very valuable. He seemed so lovely in terms, and I asked him a question. It's sort of like, what, you know, what is it that, as a teacher, you, you know what you, there's certain things that are specific that you want to give to a student. And then, but what do you, what do you want to say about the field beyond that, beyond what we don't know? And he said something about, says, well, I divide my teaching into two ways. I'm going to say it kind of wrong. But one is, you know, the analytical part where this is specific, specific things you need to know. But then the other part is, what is it? It leaves you on a cliffhanger every time? Yes. So um, I'll give an example, not from my physics class, but I'll take another subject. Um, I'll talk about artificial intelligence. So um, at my school, I'm lucky enough to be able to take these types of really high level classes. And I think even in that class, you can divide it into sort of two areas, right? There's you know, the very deep math, you know, how neural networks work, how um, all this machine learning actually works, how computers um, are able to process all of this information. And, and then there's the skills that you're given of how to apply it, how to go beyond what you taught in the classroom. And, and that comes from being very passionate about the subject, right? Um, it's one thing to go to school and learn something and kind of just leave it at that, but it's another thing to um, enjoy it and really see the um, how far you can take the technology and being able to apply it in the real world, right? Um, so I'll take I'll continue with the example of artificial intelligence, and so um, and so it, it's two words that when everyone hears it, in no matter who you are, or what field you're in, you either think this is super exciting or um, oh no, it's going to be the end of us all, um, <laughs> and um, and. That's, <laughs> yeah, it's either this, yeah. Um, and so um, that's kind of as one result of movies like The Terminator um, and, and seeing AI as this, um, this force that's gonna extinguish us and gonna be much better than us. But then um, 
And, but what you're really taught in school is how very rooted it is in you know, mathematics and logic and, um, and how we can harness that beyond um, what we're taught in the classroom and to apply it to really unique um, applications. So for example, um, very recently I've been working on using artificial intelligence to um, help patients who are diagnosed with the, uh, with the most aggressive form of brain cancer or glioblastoma. And so um, this is something that uh, a pr procedure that takes several weeks um, with the current technology that we have, but with a technology like artificial intelligence, we're able to help patients faster and give them a more fighting chance of beating cancer. And so I think this really shows like the power of artificial intelligence, and that's a result of being passionate about the subject and passionate about the people you're helping and, and very hopeful for the future that it can bring us, not frightful of its power. Now, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that you are a very focused person. That's a joke. <laughs> and, and, and you talk about passion. Yes. You have a younger brother. Yes. Who is a year younger, younger than you are. Yes. But you're very close. And you work together sometimes. Yes. Right? Now, how does a brother and sister become both tremendously focused and working together. What, what were the initial motivations that made you so passionate? So um, I have a really, really unique relationship with my brother, right? Uh, when we were younger, we did a lot of things together. Uh, we would watch Mythbusters together. We would play Legos together. Uh, we would build little connect structures together. It was, it was everything we did together. And um, kind of when we got into or on middle school, our interests kind of diverged. He took on kind of, you know, a um, passion in math, and I took on our passion in biology. But what really connected us together was our passion in computer science. Ah. And so, um, and so that has kind of been what has driven both of us. Mm -hmm. um, and working on projects, and I've realized that, um, especially when you're regarding computer science, a field isn't just one subject. It's about um, you take one subject and it's really underlying another subject. And to, in order to understand that subject, you need to know another subject. Um, and so like math, chemistry, physics, biology, they're all connected. And so um, in many ways, my brother and I form a perfect team because we complement our interests, but we also have um, kind of a connecting interest in computer science that brings us together. So in, in many ways, you were your own teachers. Yeah, I right? was, I mean, yeah. Your, or your own students, you both learners and teaching each other from what one person discovers, oh, here's a new program that might work for this thing, try this, and alongside your teachers and parents. So you were all, always engaged in, in, in something that's the upside of things. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and I think especially because we were both really interested in computer science. Computer science, you can apply to anything, right? It doesn't right. matter if you're interested in, um, in literature or you're interested in history or you're interested in biology or you're interested in math. It's like there's always some aspect of technology and computer science you can combine into your interests. Mm -hmm. right? And when, so, so let me ask you, when, when you developed this incredible lens and app to be able to diagnose um, the disease that your grandfather was suffering from. Um, you know, I, I went online and I saw there were comments of saying, oh, well, you know, if this thing will succeed, maybe, but, it, but if it, um, you know, but if it doesn't make money for the large companies, maybe it it won't happen, and then there were some snarky comments and you know stuff like that. How do you react to that when you've spent years, thousands and thousands of hours to do something, obviously for very very specific purpose for someone you love very very much? Now, how do you react to something like that when a stranger might say, "Oh, you know." This is, uh, it, you know, all this stuff should take years and years of work, and it's not, you know, that's not good enough. Well, um, 
I think reality is always good. <laughs> um, and and uh, yeah, I recognize that I've only really been involved in artificial intelligence and in building these types of devices for my high school career, which has only been three years. Um, and so um, I know, I mean, I, I face this reality of things not working when I was testing the device, right? So um, I had kind of this idealistic vision. I was like, um, I'm going to create this device. It's going to be deployed in the hospitals. It's going to work perfectly. Um, but you know, the real world doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I had originally deployed my device, there were a lot of problems. And and um, I was kind of faced to prototype it long distance with doctors in India, um, them saying, oh, this, this isn't working properly. Is there a way you can fix it? And then me thinking, having a model at home, saying, is there anything I can add to help fix this problem so that I can ship it and then it would, it would work. And um, science is always a work in progress. Um, we will never be 100% accurate the first time. Um, even my system right now, it's, it's as accurate as a human ophthalmologist, right. if not better, right? But there's always room for improvement. So sure. um, I take comments like that um, as a driving force to make me do better next time, I think. Well, then let me ask you about that. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Um, so let me ask you on the subject of hope, of being hopeful for the future. Um, it seems to me you're so involved. And it's all about learning, making things happen. Is there any room for no hope in your life? I, I like to take a very glass half full optimistic perspective on life. Um, I think I'm most hopeful for our future generation as a member of the future generation, I would say. Um, I'm hopeful that we have amazing mentors um, to support us in, in what we're doing. Um, I'm especially hopeful for, you know, fields like artificial intelligence that are kind of really just getting started now. and and they're accessible to high school students like myself. And I think that as a high school student, we take a perspective of trying everything and being okay with failure because we don't have constraints like grant money or pressure to publish or, or anything like that. We, we're able to try things. And, you know, we're, we haven't been in the field long enough to know what doesn't work. That's right. <laughs> right? So um, we look at problems as they can be solved in the future, not as they're constrained by the technology right now. <laughs> so, Pavia, I'm going to do something a little silly. Uh, Jessica's going to bring up a cello because you've never seen a cello before. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to actually uh, play something for you so you can hear the sound of a cello. Uh, now, because, now, David Scorton claims that he's going to play with me at some point, but not this time, right? So, um, just to say two things. Do you know, um, let's see, something, I hope it works well. Okay. There are four strings, it's very simple. And let me just, you tell me which is your favorite string. like this one. Okay.
This is really sweet. <laughs> so, I want to know, I want to know what went through your mind. Um, to be perfectly honest, I was looking at the vibrating strings and thinking physics. <laughs> Right. That was the first thing that went through my right. mind. <laughs> that's great. And you, uh, that's really interesting. And you know the amazing thing about the, uh, this is the length of a string, right? Mm -hmm. This is your favorite string. Yeah. What happens when you cut the string in half and if you find the exact half point, what happens? This is one note. Higher in pitch, yeah. Right? This is exactly an octave higher. And you go... Divided into four and divided into eight, right? Yeah. And it's absolutely consistent, right? But okay, so first thing, you were looking first at the thing vibrations. Thing. <laughs> yeah. um, second thing, um, I found it amazing how you can convey emotion through physics. Mm -hmm. Right through the vibrating strings, you could. I'm, I'm sure everyone in this audience felt something through your music, and and it and the and the best part is, I'm sure that everyone interpreted it differently. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask me, like what I thought about it and and how it made me feel, I'm pretty sure if you pick someone else and they listening to the exact same thing through their experiences, they would have um, experienced something completely different. Mm -hmm. I think that's magical. <laughs> that's fantastic. And what and what I can tell you in addition to which is that I could play something that's exactly um, you know accurate in a certain way but if I think something once and I think something else another time it will convey something different yeah. right so in fact it's the the um, what I try and go for when I play music is to actually locate a state of mind that I translate into music and if I stay consistent in that state of mind where the arms and the instrument there's no impedance then you get a purer version of that thought that goes to someone else's state of mind yeah. and that's the thing that I think music can have a really wonderful effect for a group of people because you end up, you know, if you did a scan with people's brainwaves at around the same place and that's when a community gets together and can do something. Yeah. And, and that's, but what you do I think is so remarkable in um, the way that you look at computer science is, you know, it's a lens to the universe, yeah. right? And the emotion that Mark talks about says, I, I want to leave you all in a state of wonder, yeah. right? Because if you have a state of wonder uh, in teaching, in museum work, in music, in what you do in solving a problem, that becomes part of our memories. Yeah. And if, when you build on memories, that's when you build when you have culture. You can transfer, translate it to somebody else, older, younger, you know, through geography, it's, it's all there. And thank you for giving us hope, and it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>